Smarties. Today, we are so excited to welcome Deanna Tyag to the podcast. Deanna is a learning specialist at Cap Educational Therapy Group, my practice in Beverly Hills, California, and virtually everywhere. And she really prioritizes the social emotional connection with learners and their learning and with her to help them to be vulnerable and explore their own learning profiles. Through a discussion that we have with her today about two fictional clients, one we called Monica, a middle school student and one we called Chandler a high school student see what we did there she talks about how important professional and parental collaboration is without perpetuating blame onto the learner themselves and she also talks about the importance of scaffolding interventions being collaborative is essential if you are listening to this episode and you're like I want my kid to have this experience call us sign up for a phone call on our website so Steph's practice is myedtherapist.com and you can sign up for a phone call there. Her practice is located in Redondo Beach in Manhattan Beach, California, and virtually everywhere. And my practice, like I said, is capedtherapy.com. We sign up for a phone call and we specialize in learners with ADHD and or executive functioning skills challenges and all the other things that come along with that. So let's dig in. You want to learn faster, but sometimes working harder is just not the answer you have to learn smarter the educational therapy podcast hi smarties welcome to episode 270 of learn smarter the educational therapy podcast i'm stephanie pitts and i'm rachel cap and today we are really excited because we have a member of cap educational therapy group with us it is Deanna Tyag. Welcome, Deanna. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. We're happy to have you. And now you're seeing how the sausage gets made because you listen to the podcast. Yeah. You hang out with us. Yeah. And so now you're seeing the whole behind the scenes of like how casual the process really can be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is very comforting and I'm sure audience members will be relieved to know that your friendship is so authentic. They are who they are on the podcast off screen too. <laughs> Thanks for that. We try for that. So why don't we start a little bit with you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and then also how you came to be a team member at Cap Ed Therapy. So stop me if I go a little long, but so my name is Deanna Tyag. Uh, I am a first generation student, meaning both of my parents, their highest level of education they attained was a high school education in the Philippines. They immigrated to America and I was privileged enough to be able to attain an excellent education at Mission Viejo Public School. Um, so I did the whole AP Ivy thing. Um, I always knew I wanted to go into education and be a teacher. After earning my undergrad in journalism at UC Irvine, clearly the journalism thing did not pan out. Um, <laughs> that was me pursuing personal interests. And Rachel knows me well enough to know that I do not have the confidence to be on screen. <laughs> so I was like, okay, no. I joined Teach for America. Um, and I taught seventh grade in Hawaii, um, simultaneously earning my master's in education at Johns Hopkins University, uh, moved back home due to the pandemic. So as everyone knows, the pandemic threw off plans, but um, looking at the bigger picture at all, at least I can say for myself, it happened for a reason. And then I began teaching seventh grade still at Southeast L.A., and what brought me to CAP Educational Therapy was I felt more fulfilled and aligned to my purpose of helping students when it was one-on-one -on -one direct intervention, especially students who do have different learning needs or learning disabilities who are often marginalized and greatly misunderstood in the classroom. And it's been an honor and a pleasure to learn from Rachel, to tangentially learn from Steph, and to be a part of the Ed Therapy Network and group. And yeah. Had you heard of educational therapy before? No, it came at the right time because I was doing a Google search, but my Google searches got really long. And I was looking for jobs that were not in the classroom, but still let me teach one-on-one -on -one and help students with different needs. And it was just a mishmash of things that I wanted. And I found CAP Ed Therapy. And I was like, shoot, like this was the perfect opportunity that met all of my personal needs as a teacher 
wanting to help others, but also gave me the space to grow professionally. And yeah, that's how I found Rachel. And it's been a great joy. I love that. And it's been a pleasure on my end to get to watch you grow even more into the role over time, over two years at this point that you've been with the practice. So the reason that I wanted you to come on and talk to our audience is because you are great at doing learning intervention in action, meaning taking what's going on with the learner and really addressing it in a meaningful and creative way. So today we're going to talk talk about two students in particular that are representative of so many kids out there. So many kids struggle with the same thing. So if you're listening to this and you think, oh my gosh, this is just like my child, it's because this happens all the time. So we're going to be talking about a middle school student named Monica and a high school student named Chandler. I'm getting to see if people like understand the Monica and Chandler. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so why don't you share with us a little bit about who Monica is and why she called? Yeah, so Monica, when she first joined the practice, was incredibly disorganized. When we looked at her grades, she had straight Fs. She had unaddressed ADHD. Mom for Monica got her evaluated. Um, And she had absolutely zero organizational strategies and was completely unmotivated to do well in school. That last part being informed by teachers were just frustrated with her. Um, It was really hard for her to feel attached or connected to a support in the classroom because teachers were checked out. Um, And understandably so. Teachers have a lot on their plate. So that was Monica before. Mom called Rachel because she was at a loss for what to do and really was seeking, at the time, immediate intervention and support. What did you do first? Talk us through the case. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I did with Monica was I took in all of the notes um, because usually when teachers provide comments, so Backstory in the process, you know, parents will share with Rachel, teachers say X, Y, and Z. Um, sometimes on intake forms, we get the whole backstory of how they're viewed in the classroom. And when I notice patterns like disruptive, disrespectful, checked out, that to me indicates that there is like a lack of connection to the classroom. And I often question how much of that is because the student feels like they're not wanted there. And so the first thing I usually do in session is just get to know them, do the social emotional check-in, build rapport. And then after the first session, when Monica felt comfortable with me, we then looked at her grades. And I always preface the first time looking at grades as like, Deanna's not judging you. We have seen it all. And there's no such thing as an impossible case. There's always room for growth. So Monica felt comfortable enough to be like, all right, here they are. And as mom told us, they were straight Fs. And so after that, mom forwarded me the psych evaluation. And we determined that much of Monica's grades were informed by her comprehension. And teachers viewed this. And I know this is mentioned on the podcast all the time. They viewed her reluctance to do work and her resistance like on purpose like she's lazy she doesn't want to do it she's not motivated and mom didn't have the language at the time to advocate for her daughter and to say look monica's not lazy she's not all of these labels you are putting on her she is genuinely lost because of where her brain functioning is at um And continuing to view her in that way is not going to be productive or great for anyone. Thankfully, they had a Deanna to step in. Um, (laughs) So first intervention was after explaining to mom what was going on regarding Monica's comprehension in both literacy and math. We then held a meeting with Monica's gen ed teachers, Monica's principal and parents, as well as the psychiatrist to see what realistic expectations we could put in place for Monica moving forward in order for her to feel supported in the classroom. While the beginning of the meeting was a lot of processing time for professional staff, 
the ultimate conclusion was that the original expectation of having Monica complete seven writing assignments was not realistic given that Monica's psych evaluation had her at five years behind in her reading comprehension. And so after explaining to teachers and principal that Monica is not lazy or actively seeking socializing or not wanting to be a good student. You guys didn't see it, but Deanna put those three ideas Bunny in quotes. Ears, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After explaining to teachers that these labels that were unfairly placed on Monica were not a result of her doing anything on purpose and that her behaviors were manifestations of her not being at grade level or following along with her peers in the classroom and using the language that I gave to parent on the phone call over on average all the peers in Monica's English class are able to keep up with middle school standards while Monica feels inadequate and left floundering and at middle school that's an age where you you want to feel accepted you want to fit in yeah and because Monica didn't feel like she was fitting in in her English and history classes, it resulted in, okay, well, instead of openly struggling and left to feel inadequate, I'm just going to go turn around and talk to my peer, distract them and engage and get positive attention in that way from my peers, which understandably frustrated teachers. But that meeting was productive because we were able to get one of the causes of where these behaviors were stemming from and why Monica's assignments weren't being turned in on time while also validating teacher frustrations. And so after that, Monica's gen ed teachers met, we checked in again, and they expressed that while they had formerly expected her to complete seven writing projects, they reduced that to one essay with peer edits, which was way more doable and realistic for Monica because she was understandably stressed. She gave up at that point with the seven projects. She was like, there's no way this is going to get done which is a completely fair and understandable emotion. And when it was reduced to, all right, we're just going to do four paragraphs of this prompt. And we knocked the essay out in a week. Mind you, within session, there's the accommodations that are built, right? Like, so a graphic organizer for the essay, chunking the material at times to get past the motivation and the, the initial, like, I can't do this. There would be times where I would put sentence starters and be like, all right, so here, read the text out loud to her. And she finished it. And then by the end, she was doing the last two paragraphs on her own because she was like, oh, this isn't that bad. But it was because the expectations were scaffolded to meet her where she was at. And so it was nice seeing her confidence increase. And by the time peer edits came around, she had a product that she was proud of, which also, you know, addressed her like, SEL or so her social emotional her confidence needs and because she was proud of it she was willing to share it with her peers and again because she got familiar with the process throughout the week of me being like hmm, I'm wondering if there's another word we could say there I'm wondering if there's another quote we can choose here's some evidence that here's three pieces of evidence pick the best one like all the scaffolds and accommodations she was able to receive feedback from her peers with with grace and without it affecting how she felt about herself And so that direct collaboration is just with teachers is just one example of the supports that having a learning specialist or educational therapist can be and can give to children and students. Perfect replacement, Deanna. So the other student that we wanted to talk about is Chandler, who is a high school student. What brought Chandler to get learning intervention? So Chandler is incredibly motivated to do well academically, but did not have the organizational strategies in place to meet his goals at the time. Chandler was a fan of leaving things to the last minute, which resulted in him being stressed and then sleeping at 2 to 3 Mm a.m. While Chandler was passing his classes, I just looked at the profile and the case and just thought to myself, there has to be a more sustainable way to meet your goals. All of the the intrinsic motivation was there. 
Chandler just needed help with the executive functioning, such as like physical organization, time management, and having structure. Because Chandler would go home from school and while Chandler was understandably tired, Chandler would be on his phone for about five to six hours and called it his decompression time. But then his decompression time would lead to more stress for future Chandler. So that was Chandler at the beginning. And Chandler's parents called CAP at therapy, seeking learning intervention, not because the classes were academically challenged. Like he wasn't struggling with the content. He was struggling with organizing himself and his time. And interventions such as grounding Chandler were not the solution. They were understandably frustrated and didn't know what to do or how to help. Right, right. So tell us a little bit about what happened once he started. Yeah, so Chandler's parents grounded him prior to starting CAP at therapy. And grounding looks like you can't be on your phone or play video games once you get home from school. But Chandler didn't have the systems of, okay, so once I get home from school, I'm going to go eat a snack. And then I'm going to go dedicate this amount of time to do my homework. This, this, this is what's due the next day. And then I'm going to have bedtime at this time. So even though the distractions such as phone and video were taken away, Chandler still just kind of sat there and thought, maybe I'll just work on this one assignment, Um, which wasn't resulting in a huge lift in his grades. So once I started working with Chandler, the first thing was we built in the system of going through his Google Classroom, starting calendar, time management, all of the stuff that I know you and Rachel have gone over in the podcast multiple times. Great interventions, but parents were still expressing that Chandler was not organizing his free time or holding himself accountable and that a lot of the interventions were happening within session. So Chandler would do the calendaring and check Google Classroom when meeting with me, but it's it wasn't happening in his free time. One, this is a common thing because, you know, progress over perfection, these things take time for clients to internalize and do independently. But two, because it was final coming up, the Chandler could not keep on this track of relying on his sessions with Deanna to be the only times that these things were happening. The first thing was I created a study plan for Chandler. And in the study plan, it has each day listed. I noticed that parents also benefit from having the steps listed out because while Chandler's parents were very engaged and checked Google Classroom, it was helpful for them to know what to look for each night. So it wasn't enough to say, hey, Chandler, I hope, is your paper done? How's that going? But chunking it up for the parents too, in terms of, okay, by this time, Chandler should have two pages done. By this day, Chandler should have three pages done. By this day, Chandler should have four pages done. Really served to like eliminate a lot of the frustration that student was feeling over, oh my gosh, my mom wants to know that my paper is done and I haven't even started on it. That just goes back to like, Parents want to help, they want to be supported, and they don't always know how to interpret the portal or the bigger picture of what's going on. So this kind of bridging the gap for them a little bit. Right. And so for parents listening on the podcast, I know that it was really helpful to have each day chunked out in steps of like, by this day, please check that Chandler has this done or this problem done or this page done. Because I can also understand and empathize with parents being overwhelmed by, hey, is your essay done? Is the whole project done? Just as we need to chunk it for our students, it also helps parents to have it chunked as well. Because then it eliminates a lot of the frustration between parent and child over, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And you're asking for a more realistic thing of your kid then of, hey, before you play video games tonight, make sure you got that one paragraph done. Chandler's parents and Chandler's relationship also improved because they were asking him for more realistic things each night. And then the next thing was in terms of structuring Chandler's homework time once he got home, I also created a tracker which had the date, the time, the location, so where Chandler was going to get homework done. Sometimes it was during free time at school. Sometimes it was at home. Mm -hmm. And the homework that needed to be completed 
And then the last piece was key, which was I feel dot, 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 because dot, dot, dot. Because prior to the tracker, Chandler would say, well, I hate doing homework. It's not going to make me feel better. And it takes too much time. Mm. Or I can finish this homework in 10 minutes the morning of. So why would I do this now? So having Chandler kind of journal two sentences of I feel blank because blank. By the end of the first week, that box changed on Friday. It was I feel better because my assignments were turned in on time and I got to sleep a little early. There you go. There you go. And now we progressed to a place where Chandler does not need the homework tracker because Chandler is telling me himself, Deanna, on my calendar, I'm going to use this time to do work on this. I'm going to use my lunch on Wednesday to work on my math problems. I'm going to use my night on Thursday to work on English. And when I ask him, oh, Chandler, that's interesting. What changed? Well, because my life is better if I just do it in advance. I'm like, yep. And so I think a lot of the interventions that we've discussed in this conversation so far are really just the first step to helping students and clients become more independent. Um, and doing it on their own. Because these are all very external, like a paper tracker for parents to see what need, what time they're going to do their homework. But it's nice that the growth eventually progresses to they do it, uh, students do it on their own. It's huge. That's the whole point. When we're talking about that educational therapy framework of keeping the end in mind, and we'll go ahead and link that. It's an early episode that we did in our first year of podcasting, but keeping that end goal in mind of we are trying to get our kids to that point of independence and autonomy, and they've learned the skills and they're planning the skills for you. That's all a sign that you've had some really effective interventions. Deanna, do you have any final thoughts that you want to make sure that you share with our audience? Yeah, I think that There is an understanding that ed therapy and learning interventions are key to student growth and to client success in the classroom and outside of the classroom. But I'm hopeful that what I shared here shows that the work that we do in ed therapy and with learning interventions is also beneficial to other stakeholders. So a lot of the interventions were provided to parents. And a lot of the collaboration happened with general education teachers to clear up any misunderstandings, but to also streamline the process for working with their child um, and with their student. And so at the end of the day, having your child in ed therapy or getting or receiving learning interventions also benefits adult growth and professional growth as well, because we all learn how to work with different clients and their needs. So yeah, essentially, I guess I just wanted to say that parents that are feeling overwhelmed, it is worth it to consider a therapy and to receive learning interventions for your student because in the end, all parents that I've worked with have expressed that their relationship with their child has grown in such a beautiful way because a lot of the frustrations and misunderstandings were alleviated due to me being the mediator and kind of engaging in those conversations and explanations. So yeah, and then the last final thought is like, it has been such a pleasure to work with Cap at Therapy and to share time with both Steph and Rachel this morning. So just thank you so much for having me. And I hope that everyone listening kind of took away something positive. Well, Deanna, I'm so glad that our audience got to experience the benefit of your wisdom and your thoughtfulness and your approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this and to prepare for the podcast as I know you did. So thank you for being here and Steph, I'm glad you got the opportunity to hang with her a bit too. So yeah, for sure. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you both and have a great week, Smarties. Have a great week. Have a great week.